That evening, I was standing in the entrance, feeling for the latch key in my pocket, when I saw a big rat coming towards me from the dark end of the passage. It moved uncertainly, and its fur was sopping wet. The animal stopped and seemed to be trying to get its balance, moved forward towards me, halted again, then spun round on itself with a little squeal and fell on its side. Next morning, on my round of visits in the outskirts of the town, where my poorer patients live, I soon discovered that the rats were the great topic of conversation. The garbage bins along the pavements were full of dead vermin. I rang up the municipal office. The man in charge knew all about the rats, to tell the truth, he was rather perturbed. Did I think it meant anything serious? I couldn't give a definite opinion, but I thought the sanitary service should take action of some kind. He agreed, and if I thought it worth the trouble, he would get an order issued. I said I certainly thought it worth the trouble. On the fourth day, they began to come out and die in batches. From basements, cellars and sewers, they emerged in long wavering files into the light of day. At night, in alleys and passages, their shrill little cries could be clearly heard. In the morning, the bodies were found lining the gutters, each with a goot of blood, like a red flower on its tapering muzzle.
The next day, the information center announced that the phenomenon had abruptly ended, and the sanitary service had collected only a trifling number of dead vermin. Everyone breathed more freely. It was, however, on this same day that when parking my car in front of our block of flats, I noticed the concierge coming towards me from the end of the street. He was dragging himself along, his head bent, arms and legs curiously splayed out, with the jerky movements of a clockwork doll. The old man explained that, feeling a bit off-color, he had gone out to take the air. But he had started feeling pains in all sorts of places, his neck, armpits, groins, and had been obliged to turn back. I ran my hand over the base of the man's neck. A hard lump, like a knot in wood, had formed there. I told him to go to bed at once. I would come and see him later in the day. I found him delirious. The glands in the neck had swollen and were hard and painful to the touch. His wife sat at the bottom of the bed, her hands on the counterpane, gently clasping his feet. She gazed at me imploringly. I rang up for the ambulance. On our way to the hospital, bending over the sick man, we could hear him muttering, them rats, them blasted rats. His wife was sobbing. Is there any hope left, doctor? He was dead before we arrived.
by dint of a persistence which many thought ill-advised, we persuaded the authorities to convene a health committee at the Préfet's office. The Préfet greeted us, amiably enough, but one could see his nerves were on edge. The only question he started by saying was what measures should be adopted. The question, old Castel cut in almost rudely, is to know whether it's plague or not. Two or three colleagues protested. The Préfet gave a start and hurriedly glanced towards the door to make sure that it had prevented this outrageous remark from being overheard in the passage. The important thing Dr. Richard suggested was not to take an alarmist view. After a good deal of argument, a resolution was arrived at to take the responsibility of acting as though the epidemic were plague. This way of putting it met with warm approval. On our way out, old Castel remarked, do you know that we haven't a gram of serum in the whole district? I knew I had rang up the depot. The director seemed quite startled. So they got alarmed at last, the Préfet said, showing us the telegram he had just received. The telegram said, Declare state of plague. Close the town. A feeling normally so individual as the ache of separation from those one loves has become suddenly a feeling in which we all share alike and together with fear the greatest affliction of the long period of exile that lies ahead.
The first onslaught of the hot weather coincided with a startling increase in the number of deaths. We worked off our feet. Attempts made by the authorities to procure us helpers by means of conscription had little success. On the other hand, voluntary teams began to form almost anywhere. True, some people said there was nothing to be done and we should bow to the inevitable. All the same, it can be said that the prisoners of the plague did put up what fight they could. The mother greeted me with a faltering smile. She hoped it was not the fever everyone was talking about. Lifting the coverlet and nightdress, I gazed in silence at the fatal stigmata on the girl's thighs and belly. After one glance, the mother broke into shrill, uncontrollable cries of grief.
During all that summer and throughout the autumn, there could daily be seen, moving along the road that skirts the cliffs above the sea, a strange procession of passengerless tramcars, swaying against the skyline. The residents in this area soon learnt what was going on, and though the cliffs were patrolled day and night, little groups of people contrived to thread their way unseen between the rocks and would throw flowers into the open trailers as the trams went by. In the warm darkness of the night, the cars could be heard clanking on their way, laden with flowers and corpses. The boy had been put in a small ward which had formerly been a junior classroom. After some twenty hours, I became convinced that the case was hopeless. The infection was spreading and the boy's body was putting up no resistance. Obviously, it was a losing fight. From four in the morning, we had been keeping watch and noting, stage by stage, the progress and remissions of the disease. The child had come out of his extreme prostration and was tossing about convulsively on the bed. Suddenly, the small body stiffened and seemed to give a little at the waist as arms and legs spread out slowly. Then there came a lull, and he relaxed a little. The fever seemed to recede, leaving him gasping for breath.
We had already seen children die, but we had never yet watched a child's agony minute by minute, as we had been doing now since daybreak. A moment later, as if something had bitten him in the stomach, he uttered a shrill wail. For moments that seemed endless, he stayed in a queer contorted position, his body racked by convulsive tremors. When the spasm had passed, utterly exhausted, tensing his thin legs and arms on which, within 48 hours, the flesh had wasted to the bone, the child lay flat on the tumbled bed in a grotesque parody of crucifixion. Light was increasing in the ward. The occupants of the other beds were tossing about and groaning, but in tones that seemed deliberately subdued. The light on the whitewashed walls was changing from pink to yellow. The first waves of another day of heat were beating on the windows. Now and again I took his pulse, less because this served any purpose than as an escape from my feeling of utter helplessness. Linked for a moment, the rhythm of our heartbeats soon fell apart, the child escaped me and again I knew my impotence. His eyes still closed, the child seemed to grow calmer. His claw-like fingers were feebly plucking at the sides of the bed. Then he suddenly doubled up his limbs, bringing his thighs above his stomach and remained quite still. For the first time, he opened his eyes and gazed at me, who was standing in front of him. In the small face, rigid as a mask of greyish clay, slowly the lips parted, and from them rose a long, incessant scream hardly varying with the respiration and filling the ward with a fierce, indignant protest so little childish that it seemed like the collective voice of all the sufferers there. The priest gazed at the small mouth pouring out the angry death cry that has sounded through the ages of mankind. He sank to his knees, and all present found it natural to hear him say in a voice hoarse, but clearly audible across the never-ending wail, My God, spare this child. But the wail continued without cease and the other sufferers began to grow restless. A gust of sobs swept through the room, drowning the priest's prayer. <laughs> Suddenly, the occupants of the other beds fell silent, and I grew aware that the child's wail, after weakening more and more, had fluttered out into silence.
Round him the groans began again, like a far echo of the fight that was now over. His mouth still gapping, but silent now, the child lay among the tumbled blankets, a small shrunken form, the tears still wet on his cheeks. official communiques, which had encouraged at first no more than a shadowy, half-hearted hopes, now confirmed the popular belief. The epidemic was in retreat all along the line. The enemy was abandoning his positions. It was doubtful if this could be called a victory. All that could be said was that the epidemic seemed to be leaving as unaccountably as it had come. Indeed, one's chief impression was that the epidemic had called a retreat after having reached all its objectives. The day of liberation came at last. The ceremonial opening of the town gates was announced. That night, on my way out to outlying districts, long after I had turned off the main streets, when I walked past shuttered houses and a joyful clamour followed me up, I somehow could not dissociate the sorrow behind those closed shutters from the joy filling the central streets. And yet it was in the mist of shouts rolling against the terrace walls and while cataracts of coloured fireworks fell through the darkness that I resolved to compile this chronicle so that I could bear witness in favour of those plague-stricken people and state, quite simply, what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. Nonetheless, I knew that the tale I had to tell could not be one of final victory. Indeed, as I listened to the cries of joy rising from the city, I remembered that such joy is always imperiled. I knew that these jubilant crowds did not know that the plague bacillus never dies, that it can lie dormant for years and bid its time. And that, perhaps, 
the day might come when, for the bane and the enlightenment of men, it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. <laughs>